as a group of American scientists discovered in the woods and mountains of the Pacific Northwest. This is that story of what they saw and learned and did as they searched for Bigfoot, or as he is called by some Indians, Sasquatch. A special lens penetrates the blackness of the forest night, searching for the legendary monster known as Bigfoot. The eight-foot-tall creature is said to roam these hills. Exactly where is not known. How do you catch a legend? Robert Morgan has come to the mountains to find out. It's late spring when Bob Morgan arrives at Cougar, Washington to renew his search for Sasquatch. After five years' research, he feels this is a prime area for contacting the creature. Others will be coming from all corners of the United States to aid in the search. Don Blake, biologist. Laymond Hardy, botanist. Anne Swain, sociology researcher. Michael Polesnik, expert tracker. Elizabeth Moorman, naturalist. Anthropologist, Peter Lipsio. Ted Ernst, Sasquatch researcher. John Crowder, biologist. Len Aiken, woodsman and Indian historian. Mary Jo Flory, microbiologist. For the next three and a half months, this diversified group of scientists and researchers will live and work in the woods, gathering evidence, looking for tracks, and trying to establish contact with a creature who some call the American Abominable Snowman. They'll scout alone at times, or work in small groups from field tents located at strategic positions in the wilderness. Keeping it all together is Robert Morgan, who will split his time between base camp and the field positions. I hope you understand, I didn't come out here to win friends and influence people. I may be wrong in what I do, but it's all for one purpose, and that is to get the job done. By his own definition, Morgan's a tough, hard-driving man who can't rest until he's gotten the job done. An early riser, You'll often see him working late into the night. He's tough because he has to be. It's the key to survival in this mountain wilderness. What gives Morgan his drive? Why is he so persistent in his search for something which others say doesn't exist? What keeps him going in the face of unrelenting ridicule and unfavorable odds? There can be no other explanation than his own personal encounter with Bigfoot 20 years ago. It was in these woods that Morgan found himself face to face with a giant. Well, it all began for me in March of 1957 when I was uh, hunting uh, in Mason County, Washington. I saw a creature there came face to face with it. 
the most manlike looking gorilla I'd ever seen. This is how I described it, because I didn't know. I'd never heard of Bigfoot, never heard of Sasquatch, or the Omaha, or the Yeti. I, I had never heard of any of that. And all of a sudden, I came face to face with this creature, about 40 yards away, I guess he was. And he had the most n knowing, knowing look on his face, his eyes. I remember the eyes, I think, more than anything else. And then I discovered, much to my surprise and shock and dismay, when I tried to report it, it was treated as though it was, it was a hoax, as if it were a joke. This creature does exist. It's here. It's all around us. We can learn from it. And yet modern science has turned its back on it. They don't want to know about it. Now, that, uh, that makes me madder than hell. We are told that giants live only in storybooks and dreams. If this is the case, then a lot of people have had the same dream about Sasquatch. Recent legends of the creature date back hundreds, if not thousands of years among American Indians. Masks, tribal rites, and rituals have been dedicated to the creature. And he's known by a hundred different names. Seatik, Oma, Bushman, Skookum, Wild Man, Sunaqua, Bigfoot. By any name, his description comes out the same. The creature is large, very large, standing eight feet tall and weighing nearly 800 pounds. He's muscular, has little or no neck, and is bipedal, which means he walks upright, like man on two legs. The tracks he leaves behind tell the story. Like the creature, they are big, some over 18 inches long and 8 inches wide. The footprints show five toes and an imprint like any one of us would leave, except for the size. They are nothing like a bear's track. Sasquatch is apparently flat-footed and walks with a four-foot stride with his knees slightly bent. Each hand of the giant primate has five fingers, but he doesn't have an opposing thumb, indicating he cannot grasp small objects the way we can. Little else is known for sure. Bigfoot is thought to be semi-nomadic, following a trail of food which is quite variable. Berries, grass, seed, fruits, even small rodents, fish, and insects. Other questions remain. Is he dangerous? Would he attack a human? While he is generally believed to be non-aggressive, these thoughts have certainly occurred to more than one expedition member, including Morgan. Do I have any fear? Of course I have fear. But what the hell is worth doing in this world if it doesn't have a price to pay? In my own instance, I have been in the close proximity of Bigfoot, and I have not been attacked. I am alive. I feel that he had every opportunity in the world to kill me on many occasions, and they have not chosen to do so. I have respect for this creature, but I don't fear him per se. of the Pacific Northwest are beautiful and awesome. If giants like Sasquatch do exist, this area would make ideal living quarters. There's enough wilderness left between Northern California and British Columbia to harbor a sizable population of the creatures. In Washington alone, there are millions of unexplored, uncharted acres. It's big country, where distance is measured in time rather than miles, and where even man must fight for survival. 
The territory is made up of dense forest, tangled brush, and rough terrain. And a few steps off the trail, anyone, including a large creature, is swallowed by the forest. The trees and underbrush provide such good shelter that you rarely see any animals. But the animals are here. You can feel their presence. You can follow their tracks if you're skilled. And there, among the tracks of elk, wolves, and wildcat, are the gigantic human-like footprints of Sasquatch. And they cannot be denied. Tracks that give monster stories credibility. The forests of the Pacific Northwest have been claimed by the loggers. But where the logging roads have not reached, where the bulldozers have not swathed a path, the country remains as it was thousands of years ago, an untamed frontier. such area is of particular interest to Morgan. He wants it scouted for future exploration. In the expedition, only one man has any chance of entering this rugged, cheerless territory and returning safely. The call goes to Mike Polesnik, an authority on surviving in the woods. He will go alone. situation is, as you know, this area, as far as I know, uh, according to the people who live around here, has never been crossed. They, they hunt the peripheries. Uh, one guy, as far as we know, goes up a uh, short distance up this stream in order to fish, but they don't go in here. But the problem is, you see, the logging areas have have surrounded this area. It's, it's kind of a, you know, uh, an oasis. I've been wanting to go in here for two years. You have five days. Use your own time, use your own judgment. And the important thing is there's no possible way of radio contact or anything else. You're, you're on your own. And, uh, all I can tell you is be careful. All right, if I get on to anything, I'll go ahead and stay right on it until I get a positive ID or establish communication in some form. If you're having problems, Put up a flare, right. okay? And uh, we'll, you know, take a bearing on that, okay? Mm -hmm. That's it, my friend. You got all your gear? How much food do you have? Five days. That's it. To the casual observer, the area where Mike is headed appears tame and inviting. But an experienced woodsman like Mike knows that staying alert means staying alive. There's so much to be done in such little time. Morgan keeps the expedition going at an accelerated pace. With Polesnik on his way, he and Ted Ernst set out to explore the lava flows of Mount St. Helens, once an active volcano. They'll spend the first day together. Then Ted, like Mike, will be on his own. Wherever he goes, Morgan is constantly reminded that he is the visitor, the intruder in Bigfoot's territory. In his element, he is king. We are the invaders. He has no fear, builds no cities. He violates everything that we have stood for. He belongs with this earth. He belongs here. He lives with nature. We, unfortunately, live in spite of it. He's part of nature. We create our own air conditioning, Neon lights, one-way streets, parking meters. Good Lord. 
We must carry food on our back. We have to eat specialized diets. We have to have this, we have to have that. We have a high fatigue factor, etc., etc., etc. Hell, he doesn't carry a pack. And this creature walks among God's world as if he's one of them. And he leaves very little behind him except tracks. It's kind of sad that we are in pursuit of a creature that lives so beautifully with nature. Perhaps, just perhaps, we can learn from them. Morgan receives a phone call from a logger named Skip Wood. Good Lord, a six foot... Now that was a six foot stride, huh? Good While clear-cutting acreage in Washougal sure County, can. Wood and several others were visited by a large, hairy animal. You haven't lost any loggers The creature, today, matching Bigfoot's description, no watched the lumbermen from a rock clearing above their camp. And they watched it for four hours. Uh, th this is very intriguing because the, uh, oh, this is the second report now we've had in within two months of uh, cat logging and having the creatures come near, you know, uh, loggers at, during the day, which is extremely unusual. And I'll be en route within, uh, within the hour. Thank you so very much. We'll get underway, and I appreciate very much your call. Have a nice day. Bye. Hot report. Day before yesterday. Reports similar to Skip Woods have been on the increase in recent years as civilization creeps deeper into the forest. They're not just limited to the Pacific Northwest. The skunk ape of Florida, the bush monster of Idaho, the Sunaqua of Canada, the Yeti of the Himalayas, all bear a striking resemblance to Bigfoot. Could it be that these creatures are cousins, members of an evolutionary strain unknown to modern man? And does it roam these woods with bear and other wild animals? Morgan wants to find out. It's half a day's drive from Cougar to Washougal County over rough terrain and washed out roads. When the expedition group arrives, Wood is eager to tell them about the unwelcome visitor. Now, this happened last Friday. Yeah, Friday. What, what happened? Well, Again. It just happened to see one climbing up the hillside there. And it was going all the way up that bluff? Yeah, it started out there in that little hole I showed you there, and went hand over hand or hand over foot, however you describe him climbing. Stayed up to the top and stood up there and watched it. And uh, your whole crew was down here, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. There was, um, yeah, there was Chuck Owens. Skip told me, the, our boss told me that, uh, or said that there was something climbing up on the mountain up there, and so I turned around and looked. And Leo Casey and Bob Irwin. I just saw a steady thing. Standing there, it looked like maybe a tree waving in the wind a little bit. All I could see was a big black glob. Dark, that's all I could tell you. Do you see the uh, outline distinct so that it was definitely walking on two hind legs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Just, it was standing out there. I mean, it was too big for a bear, and bears don't walk on hind legs unless they're fighting anyway. And that would be my logical explanation for it, was that it was a bear. Well, the way it went up the mountain, the way everybody describes Bigfoot, that's the only thing I can think it was, because a bear just don't do, do things like that. And you've had a feeling around this camp since you moved in here? Yeah. Uh, you can feel them watching you. Only, only thing, when I first started to work here, I'd look at that mountain and I knew I didn't want to be around it, because it was just that uh, I knew something was there, or something was watching me all the time. I look up there all the time now because I expect to see it again someday. Mm. You just might. The loggers want nothing further to do with this or any other Sasquatch. So Morgan and Elizabeth Mormon set out alone for the rock face where the creature was seen. A 
heavy rainfall the night before has left the ground wet and slippery, making the treacherous climb even more hazardous. They must make their own trail as they go. What looked so near from below will take them six hours to reach, and they must hurry to return by dark. Reaching the summit, the pair finds little more than a spectacular view. Morgan has chased too many reports, followed too many leads to be discouraged. His work done here, he heads back to base camp. It's still early in the expedition. We both believe that we... Before our film crew it. arrived, expedition member Ann Swain had what might have been the first Sasquatch big. sighting of the expedition. She recounts the incident. I turned to my right and I looked down at the end of the creek and as I lift my binoculars, I saw this huge black form. And I just... I just froze, and, and I looked, and maybe three seconds passed. And I put my binoculars down. I was really excited. I didn't know what it was. I saw it. It was large, and it was behind these bushes. And I put them down, and I called to Bob, and as I put them back up to look again, it was gone. When we got into the woods, to the forest, there was uh, impressions, and they were larger than even a large man would make. And it was just where the pine needles had been, it was very wet in there, had been pressed down and made wetter than the surrounding area. There's a lot of evidence in this country. There's a lot of reports. And uh, I'm thoroughly convinced there is a Bigfoot out here. Many of them, family. The group returns to Cougar in time to pick up Mike Polesnik, who's covered 20 square miles during his five-day trip alone in the woods. For you. On his way out, Mike found large, barefoot, human-like tracks. It's exciting news. Coming out of the woods, next to the berries, and there's still berries on the ground. Not that long, barefoot. He's flat-footed. I, oh, I thought they were human. But I went back on my way down. I don't think they are. Okay, how far off the road are they? It's, uh... Pretty close to the mountain. Quite a ways up. No, it's uh, it's not a long ways up. It's uh, right there where the trail begins. Can we get Pete Lips in there? Yeah, I need to see him. And how about up on the mountain? Oh man, three hours going up. Uh, a cat come in the first night. The second night he come in closer. The third night I left. <laughs> <laughs> I think he knew I was scared. <laughs> okay. Oh, did I find something? There's something there. <laughs> All, right. All right, by the way, I think... Uh... Large human-like footprints on the trail in an area where Morgan suspects Bigfoot could be. This might be the breakthrough the expedition has needed. Certainly, it could mean one or more of the creatures is in the area or has been recently. The risk of sending Mike into such a dangerous place has apparently paid off. Yeah, that's a good place for you. Can we eat well? Yeah, berries. Strawberries. Carry your part in there. And there's snakes. Good lord, everywhere. Rattle? Yeah, when I, when I left the camp, I wasn't 50 feet when I left that morning. And almost got me. <laughs> right off the road. Where I right on the trail. Right on the trail from camp. So the snakes are everywhere. So the loggers have worked. It's dangerous because uh, of the trees, there's sharp edges sticking up like this. If you stumble and fall, it's, it's all over. One guy could go in there and never come out. With fresh tracks to be examined, the group wastes little time back at base camp.
just long enough for Mike to get a beer and doctor his feet, which blistered during his journey. Earliest reports of tracks found in these forests date back to 1811. A trapper stumbled across footprints 14 inches long and 8 inches wide. Over the last five years, Morgan has found numerous tracks in these parts. The ones Mike found are the latest in the long string of evidence Sasquatch has left behind. These particular tracks leave little doubt that something large with man-like feet has passed through here. It had to have went into the woods, and after that, you just couldn't pick up anything with the foliage on the ground. Pete, make your round measurements. Uh, photograph, measure. We'll photograph it up and take measure it. I'm going to let Michael pour some gifts. Mike, would you, would you give me a, a hand here for one second, please? Just hold on to that, OK? Very interesting. All right. Something's moved through here. These ferns are down. OK, hold it. Good. I never cease to be amazed that when I see a, a Bigfoot footprint and look at it, that I really don't realize the, the massiveness of it until I put a ruler down. And then I say, good Lord, you know, that's 16, 17, or 18 inches. You don't realize it until you put that ruler down. And consequently, if you were walking casually by, not looking for Bigfoot, and you saw barefoot footprints, you'd probably ignore them. I'm sure that it's been done many times. As a plaster record of two of the tracks is made, out, the mood of the group changes. It goes from elation over finding the prints to anxiety. Expedition members become tense, on edge. There is the sense of danger. Others who have been in the vicinity of Sasquatch have reported similar eerie feelings. The hope is that whatever made these footprints is still in the area and might return. I'll become part of the cast. If you take a walk back through this area, you're going to find a couple of things rather interesting. Number one, all the berries are gone. Number two, there is fresh and old breaks in these ferns leading all the way back up into this area. I didn't, I didn't find the end of it. I just found them. It would be senseless to send a scouting party into the surrounding woods. The tracks are now several days old, and there are too many places around here to hide. So the group heads back to camp, satisfied with what they've uncovered. By early August, Morgan has gathered enough data about Bigfoot in western Washington to warrant new plans. He's convinced there are two or more families, mother, father, and one or more young, who travel a specific route through the Mount St. Helens area. Minor changes in field positions We'll place the researchers right along this movement route. We're going to tighten up. As you know, when we first came out here, we thought of three migratory or, or movement route patterns. We've pinned down one that seems to be used now. So rather than ranging out now, it's time, I think, to move in closer. If you can't find the creature, Morgan likes to say, let the creature find you. You can do what you want during the day. You know, do your normal tracking and ranging out during the day. But in the evenings, is the, in, in the early morning hours, set your alarms and, and from pre-dawn till perhaps two or three hours after dawn, I think we should be especially aware. So I'll show you the way we're going to do this. Don, you and Layman are going to take... What we have done here, we've established four camps along a line which I feel is a movement route. When the creature goes from one wilderness area into another wilderness area, these areas are accessible. I 
I cannot go into the total wilderness areas because we are not logistically equipped to do so. Here I'm trying to get him a little bit on my ground. Hopefully, they will either observe him in movement or the creatures will come to their camp. I ask my people to be in from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. to be awake, aware of what's going on around them. Now, I do not permit firearms in the field. I don't feel it's necessary. I feel that if a creature like this wants you, your firearms are nothing more than an iron teddy bear. Because he's going to get you. So certainly, there can be a time when this creature could be dangerous. But if you don't want to get wet, stay the hell out of the water. If you're not willing to take that chance, don't come along with me. It's as simple as that. And every one of my people, they know this, they understand it, and they accept it. Now, out of the camp, the, uh, the people will rove during the day. And they go within certain areas that I've assigned and they rove around, and uh, the biologist and botanist are doing their job, which is an updating, constant updating. I'm getting a constant update of what food is available, what succulents are available, what animals are moving where. Uh, the biologist, the tracker, is telling me um, uh, what, what animals are feeding on. I'm constantly aware of what is happening out there. What is the weather like? Uh, uh, what animals have been eating by the defecations, uh, the browsing, uh, whether or not the animals are in abundance, are they sitting still, are they moving? Where do they water? I'm constantly aware of everything that's going on out here. We come right back to the basics again, to the, you know, the, to the cynical, ruthless point, and this is produce the creature. And everything else is all nice, it's interesting, makes life very uh, exciting and so on, but that's about all it does. Morgan has driven to the Canadian border to confer with two men who are chasing Sasquatch through British Columbia, where creature sightings have become commonplace. Rene de Hinden lives here year-round, and has been on Bigfoot's trail for two decades. John Green, author journalist, has written three books on the subject. Over a picnic table rich with Bigfoot artifacts, the three men discuss their different operating methods. Dahinden and Green both say the creature must be brought in dead or alive. Morgan contends that Sasquatch is too human-like to destroy. Uh, I don't think there's any argument that the fastest way to bring this to legislation for the betterment of the species, the fastest way would be killing one. Um, the only I think way. <laughs> possibly. However, the killing of one, how does the... I, I just feel that there... I, I really feel that the youth of this world and the, the people that are young at heart have had enough of the killing. I really feel they have had sufficient of the slaughter species for the so-called enlightenment of man. But I think that it is time for a new precedent to be set, for legislation to be passed on an accepted species without total uh, so-called scientific knowledge. All right, I, why pick this species? I Are you going to stop people st from slaughtering hundreds of thousands of deer every Why time? not start now? Why start with this one? 
Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. Hmm. It's because it looks more like man than any other, and as far as I'm concerned, that is a concern for humankind, not for any animal kind. You remind me of the little old lady who got all hepped up when I told her um, I would kill a Sasquatch, and then she went in and had a steak dinner. First thing first, and the first thing is to find proof, 100%, so there's unquestionable evidence available which proves the existence of this creature. And the rest of them is all, well, it's nice. You know, you can dream about it and so on, but um, you have to be cynical, you have to be ruthless, and you have, it's, it's no game. It's no game. It's one of the biggest scientific discoveries the world has ever seen. In an anthropological and probably zoological and biological sense, and might revamp or turn over the whole theory of evolution and everything else. But I would... That would flip our lid, to put it bluntly. But I would rather... So therefore... Uh, you know, never mind the philosophical discussions. Um, I say, go grab them any which way. I would rather lose than win that way. Well, you know, if you are in this business 20 years, um, you haven't got time anymore for... for um, no, I'm in this to collect the Sasquatch, dead or alive, to prove it's its existence. And, you know, that's all there is to it. While Morgan is away, a local resident discovers large impressions practically in the expedition's backyard. Mike Polesnik and Layman Hardy visit the area to see if the tracks will yield other clues. Like a team of detectives, they scour the area, and their efforts pay off. Apparently, something large was walking along this frigid mountain runoff, perhaps to cool off from the heat. And while walking, slipped on a moss-covered rock leaving several hairs and a large impression in the stream bed. The hair is sent to Mary Jo Flory at her laboratory in Portland for analysis. It will take several weeks for her to determine who or what left it behind. A giant hourglass, the melting snows of Mount St. Helens are a constant reminder that summer is slipping away. Near the base of the mountain, Don Blake and Layman Hardy have heard strange sounds. Loud, piercing screams, which they cannot place. Morgan has sent Len Aiken to investigate. They didn't sound like uh, birds. And I couldn't imagine it being a cougar, because it didn't make a noise like uh, the cougars we hear it back home. Uh, and, of course, I don't know all the noises that elks and uh, deer make. It's uh, uh, possible I know that it's some. too early in the year for elk. Elk will start, you know, in rutting season, it starts about oh, mid-September, October. Yeah. So it's it's early for that. What did it resemble? Anything? Or? It was not a human-type scream. Uh, it's it's the type that I've heard uh, chimps make. Hmm. It's sort of a chimp-type scream. scream. And, uh, completely. I'll go, along, I'll go along with that. It did sound like... Uh, the kind of noise that you hear a chimpanzee make when, say, you're taking something away from him, you know, a, uh, not an alarm, just more of a... Frustration. Yep. Uh, hmm. But it was quite a little distance off. It was probably as much as a quarter of a mile hmm. in September. While scouting nearby terrain, Aiken and Blake discover a lava tube cave, one which no human has ever entered. Getting around the mountains has presented no problem for Blake, who has used crutches most of his adult life. The cave is just another challenge. Go ahead and that opens up. Now then, we're losing altitude fast. We're dropping, let's see, five feet for every eight, aren't we? 
Dozens of the caves formed when molten lava gushed through the valleys from a violent Mount St. Helens. The underground tunnels are the longest of their kind in the world and could provide winter shelter or even burial grounds for Sasquatch. There are places the cave is six feet high, yeah. but it's five feet. Six, I have to be careful that I don't break my head somewhere. It would take several years to explore all the lava tubes, if you could find them all. This cave offers little besides relief from the heat. Well, that's quite a cave there, Lena. <laughs> you were gone two and a half hours. Coming out. <laughs> Feel that heat just blast you right square in the face as soon as you get to look at that hole. While you were gone, I was reading something roll rocks down from the top of the hill right up here. Hmm. When there was about five different intervals of it, probably 15 or 20 minutes apart. And uh, then there was one time I heard uh, rotten wood move, crash or something. So I don't know whether it was an elk or a bear or some other animal. Whatever, whatever it was, probably no doubt came up another side because this side over here is a little on the steep side. But the heat of this sun, though, most anything up there would be under those trees. Yeah. Probably was navigating under the trees. They got, they got more brains than we've got. Could it have been Bigfoot? He's been known to throw rocks at people before. Or could the giant creature turn out to be a giant hoax? Unlikely, in the face of countless reports by people who say they've seen him. People who have nothing to gain by fabricating a story. People like Patty Carter, who as a young girl was befriended by a young Sasquatch. Patty, it was a couple of years ago, uh, I guess when we first met, and you told me rather, I, th I found an intriguing story about what happened to you when you were a child. And I wonder if you'd recount that for me on your first encounter. Well, there was two of them. Big, a big one that was fairly heavy with child young, whatever, and uh, a young one stood there and looked at me for a while, and then they come down to the creek, got a drink, and then they left. Anyway, they come back about every week, and got so I'd take them down some venison sausage Daddy made. And uh, we'd, they'd eat it, and they'd throw sticks and rocks and stuff, play catch with it. With who? With you? The young one, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't never, we wouldn't throw at you? Would no, you? just to me. Very gentle. Underhand type motion. Very, very gentle. Did you ever throw, the, throw it back to him? Uh-huh. And then what would he do? He'd pick it up and throw it back to me again. And how long would this go? A couple hours, like playing catch with it. The one, the female, it had its baby not too terribly far from me. It's like, oh, about 25, 30 yards, I imagine. Was that in a cave, or was no, it No, it was behind the, it was by the creek, by the stump, behind the stump. Behind the stump. Did, mm -hmm. did uh, the creature make any sound? Well, no more so than anything else. We're giving birth to a young one, it hurts. <laughs> and then what did the creature do? Well, it, it wouldn't let me near it at all, near the little one. Mm -hmm. And uh, she cleaned it off and uh, picked it up with this way, held it next to her, real close to her. Do you, do you think that these creatures are animals? No, they are not. They're humans. If I took a look at these tracks down here good, and they were about six inches wide and about 18 inches and a half long. Sounds crazy, don't it? <laughs> but it's true. What do you think, Annie? What do you think it was? I don't have no idea what it was. But you know something was there? Yeah, I never heard a big foot at the time. I'm scared to death. Yeah, but we got one hell of an introduction here one night. Let me tell you, we did.
The creature is real, very real to folks like Don Autry and his wife Annie, who live down the road from Expedition Headquarters. Bed goes right through that door right over there, then. And uh, I was laying there and I heard something groan. I raised up on the airborne, I listened to that just for a minute. And I was asking, well, what in the hell's going on here? And I hollered, Aunt. By the time I hollered, Aunt, she was standing there on the door. She said, Are you a groany? <laughs> I said, No, hell, I ain't a groaning. And uh, she said, Well, there's something is. And I got up. You can you, you're going to have to hit me on this little bit, for I don't remember exactly all of it, how it happened. But I was scared that I got to death. That's all he was doing. And, uh, Anyhow, I come out of the bedroom and come in here and I listened to that for it just a minute. And I got an old single shot 22 that I had, just single shot, you know. So I loaded it. Then I went to the bathroom. And while I was in there in the bathroom, remember what that was coming from out of the woods back from about southwest, coming this way here. And, uh, damn, it sounded like he weighed five, six hundred pounds, even more, just really putting his feet down heavy, you know. And, uh, was it moaning at that time? Yeah, moaning all the time. Never quit moaning. And anyhow, he'd come on up to the bathroom wall there, and I stood up in the bathroom floor, and that bathroom at that time was four foot off the ground. And that sound, he was this close to the house, and that sound was coming right straight through the wall, right into this, just like a kiss, you know. And then he thrashed all around out here, and I come back in here, and we sat around. What else could you do but sit there and listen to the thing? And I did. I started to go outside. And I got right along in here. There was another deal out here that I tore off since then. And she grabbed me by the arm. She said, you don't know what you're going out on. And there ain't no damn way you got me outside then. Did you have any feeling? <laughs> did I have any feeling of fear? <laughs> How tight did I squeeze you, huh? It wasn't me. It was the gun. It was a squeeze. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was scared. You betcha. Definitely. I was scared. I logged this country. I've been logging it for 11 years, and I'd never seen nothing. I'd never seen a footprint until this. I just walked right up on it right here at the house. And it wasn't a prank. It wasn't a prank. It wasn't a prank. For a man, it had to have been over eight foot tall to make tracks in that snow like this down here. And I don't know nobody that big. And I was born and raised in the woods. I've killed bear, helped kill elk, deer, everything. And I've never heard nothing like this. Pray she sees a bimbo. Oh, what joy, oh, what joy they bring to me. How I long once more to be with my friends at the old country tree. And the reports continue, each similar to the one before, except for place and time. Too many reports from too many people for a hoax to be considered. And the same I believe that this could be a possible area for him. There's no roads here. There's no roar of the logging trucks. There's no shooting. There's no people chattering about. He can walk around here at ease because nobody comes in here. Despite warnings not to go, Morgan and Polesnik return to the untamed area that Tracker explored earlier in the summer. Even with the 
introduction of four-wheel drive vehicles and snowmobiles, this American frontier has been unwilling to yield to man. The pair has food for seven days. The snakes are everywhere. Back to Matt last night? Back up on the side pocket. Water's hot. Idea is always to follow this up. I just hope we don't have to go over that. You see how sheer it was on the far side? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Straight up. If we can get it. Follow this along. I don't. I don't want to go high. But it's not necessary yet. Ever since 1970. I've been following areas, finding uh, tracks, species, and all this jazz coming down through this area. And it's just recently come into a, what I think is a movement pattern. And what our objective is, is to go entirely through on the north fork of this, this creek up to Mount Mitchell. And it's my understanding that not too many people have ever done this. And uh, as you know, the dire warnings that we have received that uh, people go in and they don't come out. <laughs> you know. But in any case, this is a flow line coming down through here, and it's a natural, it's a natural walkway. It's very hidden. So far, it's been pretty rough. I don't know what it's going to be like when we get deep down into the ravine. Well, I don't know. I just, you know, when you stand up on the cliff side and look over this valley, it's one thing. You get down here, it's something else. I sure agree. We'll find out. Well, Bob, I sure could have had a better choice of people to go out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> So far, the only passable way through this wilderness is along the riverbed. The water is icy, the algae-covered rocks treacherous. 
On the second day, despite their pleas, Morgan orders the camera crew to stay behind. The rest of the journey is too risky. Others who have challenged the river beyond this point have never returned. heat has driven Elizabeth Mormon to seek refuge under nature's own shower. Here, Bob. For Morgan and Polesnik, the trip through the river valley has been arduous and frustrating. Okay. A bad fall has left Morgan with several bruised ribs. On more than one occasion, they felt they were being followed. Whether it was a bear, cougar, or some other creature, they could not be certain. The journey has affected them both physically and emotionally. The experience, they say, has been like a tribal initiation into manhood. They have been baptized by the forest, but still no Sasquatch. And I've been warned time and again not to go into this area because a lot of people have been, have gone in and haven't come out. Well, like anything else, you, you go in and find out why. Find out for yourself, then you know. It's not a matter of someone telling you. We discovered that coming up along that river, for instance, it was like stepping back in a time machine. I think I've seen what this country must have looked like perhaps thousands upon thousands of years ago. Coming up over the top of that ridge, we found an area where berries are, are so abundant that we literally ate our way over the mountain. But when we crested that ridge, and started down in this area for the past few miles. The area took on another character. It took on a forbidding, foreboding aura. And I knew, I just knew damn well we weren't welcome. And literally, every step of the way, Mike and I You just know, you know, you, if you make a mistake, there's no way in the hell you're going to come out. But you know, it, it gave us a new awareness, a new respect for wildlife, because the deer and the elk and the bear, they live with it every day. But I am convinced, and I welcome anyone that is a skeptic on it to come along with me, I'm convinced that this area, there's no problem whatsoever for a creature like Bigfoot to live in almost a Garden of Eden without any worries about man. There's very few men ever enter this area.
Hello. Oh, Bob, this is Mary Jo. Sorry. And you remember those hairs that you sent out to the lab about a month ago? Yeah, yeah. I finally got a report back from the director of the lab on those. And he feels that those are human body hair from the lower extremities. From the lower extremities? Of course, mm. it doesn't confirm absolutely, but it certainly is highly indicative. Well, the circumstances under which they were found, you know, is very well documented. And I think the chances of that being homo sapien is very, very low. Well, I am inclined to agree with you. Thanks for making this a very good day. Bye-bye. sizzles on. Logging is temporarily halted on orders from the Forestry Service. The extreme fire danger has made logging too risky. The town of Cougar, which mirrors the lumber industry, becomes deserted. Day after day, the temperature touches 100 degrees. Morgan is warned the forests may be closed to everyone, including his researchers. But for now, the expedition is allowed to continue. Still, no rain in sight. What I saw, Bob, was uh, located on the far right side of that mass of trees. It was large enough for me to see with the unaided eye. John Crowder has seen something he can't identify on a ledge near the snow line of Mount St. Helens. A strange sense of fear had invaded his camp shortly before the sighting. It was a feeling no one could explain, like so many other things this summer. Big enough to see. Well, you know of the gray Bigfoot that's uh, been reported in this area, but also I think we should be aware that there are, I believe, mountain goat up in this area. There's only one thing to do, and that's survey the ledge close up. Morgan and the others have made this climb many times before, on another mountain at another place in the forest. Morgan has become weary from the endless climbs and dead-end trails, but any feeling of fatigue he may have is no match for his unrelenting drive to find the Sasquatch. He's so close now, he feels nothing will stop him. All the signs are there, the tracks, screams, reports from loggers and residents. Morgan is convinced he's located a movement route for at least one family of Bigfoot. A movement route that goes straight through Ape Canyon. Named that in the 1920s, when a group of prospects were attacked by vicious, hairy apes. Ape Canyon is just beyond where John Crowder saw something large and gray. There's little relief from the scorching heat. And at this altitude, the thinner oxygen adds to the physical stress of the climbers. It's hard to describe the frustrations of having made the climb and finding little more than scuff marks. Morgan knows time is running against him. I think that next to closed-mindedness, I think time is our greatest enemy. Most definitely time. The lumber industry is cutting into the forest. Man is moving in more in his snowmobiles and his trail bikes, his four-wheel drive vehicles. The Bigfoot has to retreat. So we're running a race against time. Very definitely, it's a very pressing, a very very frightening thing, time. They start down in silence, hoping to reach their vehicles before sunset. But the day is not over. What do you think, Bob? It's old stuff. Has a lot of clean edges. Well, it, it's hominid, bipedal. And what does that thing measure again? Oh, roughly 13 to 14. And there's been a lot of washing here on the width, but it would go at least six. 
at the wide, widest point. Well, it's, it's not where a few rocks laid no, and, no. and rolled away. We've seen enough of that up here. Add another. Add another mystery. August passes the sun to September, but the forest has had enough. A small fire breaks out not far from the main logging road, but a safe distance from the expedition camps. Firefighting teams are on the scene quickly, and the forestry service is encouraged by a general stillness of the wind. Morgan keeps in touch with the fire's progress. The fire burns into the night. And the next morning, through self-generating winds, it begins to burn more rapidly. More acres are threatened. The Forestry Service calls for help, and the small band of firefighters turns into a sizable camp. Despite the efforts of 600 people fighting the inferno, the fire goes over the hill and into Ape Canyon. Morgan is distressed as the fire spreads quickly through the canyon. All the evidence of Sasquatch in the area has led directly to this place. He surveys the situation with Sam Melville, star of the Rookies television series, who's visiting for a few days. out of their base camps or out of their their camps yeah it's possible i warned uh, the two biologists you know they're right over the ridge they're right over the top and this will alter elizabeth going back into the lake it's just a flat block for for a movement i'm afraid with all these people look at look at hundreds of people that are going to be in this area fighting a fire they're going to be running up and down airplanes over you think a shy creature is going to come with him all our waiting and all our planning and planning. Our whole damn concept was locked along that one route. And there's not. He may take he may take the western route, may come around here, God only knows, but see what we've been banking on, you know. The last several years is gathering information along this one route. And and now, with this cut in the middle right now, I don't, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't know what, how it'll affect the, the movement patterns. I don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's a factor that I hadn't... And count it on, for sure.
marks the end of the road for this particular expedition. There's little doubt the fire and the hundreds of people fighting it will lead the Bigfoot to an alternate route. But for Robert Morgan, it's far from the end of the road. He'll be back next year, and the year after, and the year after that. He'll be back for however long it takes him to satisfy the world. But we are merely men among the giants. Stay tuned as a panel of experts discusses a contemporary look at Bigfoot. Continuing with the search for Bigfoot, we now present Bigfoot, Fact or Fiction, an in-depth discussion with notable anthropologists on the existence of Sasquatch and other myths that have followed mankind through history. Our guests include Dr. Robert Toonin, Director of Anthropology, University of North Florida, Jacksonville. Dr. Linda Wolf, Department of Anthropology, University of Florida, Gainesville. Jack Lapsaratus, social scientist and author of Psychic Sasquatch. Dr. Alan Tilly, University of North Florida, Jacksonville, author of Plots of Time, a book of myths in history. And now, here is your host, Bill Carter. Before we go to our learned guests here, what we'll do first is talk with Jack Lapsaritis. He is a self-professed social scientist and applied anthropologist who says that he has tracked and seen Bigfoot. I've written a paper and have, pre have presented it uh, at the International Conference on Paranormal Research at Fort Collins, Colorado. The title of the paper was Psychic Anthropology. Uh, using map dowsing as a legitimate tool to locate areas of Bigfoot activity. Now, because throughout the years that many of the other researchers have used every possible tool uh, to locate, and it's not happened, that I was reading areas of parapsychology where psychics claim to have uh, actually located missing persons. So in, in the loose sense of the word, uh, the Sasquatch are a missing people. Now, I decided uh, in 1979 to put together a team of psychics uh, that were uh, very proficient in, in map dowsing. That is, the, the use of, of pendulums and so on. This is something I didn't entirely understand at first. and. I was still, believe it or not, somewhat skeptical. But I thought all these other uh, means of trying to locate Sasquatch have failed in the last 30 years for all the researchers all over the United States. And why not try something uh, innovative, try something new and fresh? And I have absolutely nothing to lose. So in setting up this experimental design, and did it as objectively and scientifically as I could, the idea to me was to build statistics. So in using three uh, psychic map dowsers, uh, I first set it up in three stages. The first phase was to get a, which I did, a 2,705 square mile forestry map in the very northern part of the Oregon Cascades. Uh, the each dowser independently of the other, not knowing uh, what the other had doused, uh, would doused on this map, facing it north, and using a picture of a purported real Sasquatch to tune into, which is a part of this dowsing process. That way, uh, the people could better locate and tune into this particular area of Sasquatch activity. So this was a very general map. Each person that did this out of the three pinpointed the exact place 
of where they claim the Bigfoot people were in a home cave. Now, I next had ordered six topographic maps, that is quadrant maps from the U.S. Geological Survey of this particular region of which they had doused to be more specific, and this is a part of phase two. These are blown up maps. I laid the six maps onto the floor facing north, and the question was asked, which map is it that the areas of Bigfoot activity? And each dowser pointed to exactly the same map. And when I took that map and laid it on the desk, facing it north again, they, each one independently, at a different day even, so one didn't know what the other was doing, independently doused. And I was absolutely shocked. I was astonished that the one, each dowser hit the exact target area. Uh, one was 100 feet from each other, the other was 50 feet from the other creating sort of an elongated triangle. So this, to me, was unbelievable. Statistically, it was 100%. It could have been anywhere. It could have been five miles away. It could have been 15 miles away. But we're talking about feet now. The only way to validate this, to validate this scientific experiment, to see if it was, if they actually were real, that is, if the Sasquatch were there in this cave, was for me to go alone, so it would be non-threatening, without a gun, to this area as a part of phase three to validate it. This I did. At the time, I was working at an Indian agency, running the agency, and so I took two weeks off to go into the Cascade. In doing so, I went to the exact spot and set up a camp. And in this place, I went out to look for water, so I'd have a red, red a water supply readily available to me. In so doing, I crossed a trail uh, while I was going down the side of this very steep 6,000-foot mountain. And there on the trail, in dried mud, was a human-like track showing five toes and no claws. And it definitely was not a bear. Uh, I was raised hunting, fishing, and trapping. and. Uh, I was an accomplished taxidermist by age 16, and I know my animals, and uh, I know animal tracks, and this was a human type, uh, by, because of the size and because of the shape. It, the trail in itself led straight up to the area designated on the map by the three dowsers as the home cave. Now, by the time I found water, went back to my campsite, there was a tremendous crash that went on there. And I said, perhaps it's a deer. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to uh, fantasize and think it must be a Sasquatch. So I looked for tracks. There were no uh, undulate tracks, that is, hooved animals digging up the forest. There were no tracks at all. So. I cl climbed into my tent and started to arrange my uh, gear, and I had my camera, a zoom lens movie camera, because the idea was to try to capture on film uh, one of the creatures and then to match it or compare it uh, with the Roger Patterson movie that was taken uh, at Bluff Creek, California. I thought that in making this comparison, therefore, one would not have to go out and shoot a creature we would have additional evidence, and especially with a zoom lens that could zoom right in on it. Well, I also had a flash camera for at night. Well, when I went into my tent to arrange my gear, something on two legs walked out of the forest and started walking up to my tent. I slowly grabbed my camera, unzipped the tent, and jumped out. And when I did, there was nothing there, at least nothing visual that I could see. This perplexed me. I went back into the tent, said, it must have been a squirrel or something. I guess I just imagined that. I started to rationalize that reality. But to my amazement, the, the bipedal creature, the two-legged creature that is, continued to walk towards my tent from where it had stopped previously. So slowly again, I unzipped the tent and jumped out with camera in hand 
and there was nothing visual there at all. I did this three times, and on the third occasion, climbed back into the tent, totally confused, just in time to hear something on two legs walk away back into the forest from immediately right outside my tent. Of course, the answer to this is that, and I'll, I can, I've documented this uh, many, many times over uh, since I have 56 people that have claimed uh, a mixture of Bigfoot telepathic experiences and Bigfoot psychic experiences as well as Bigfoot UFO experiences. Joining us now is uh, Dr. Alan Tilley, an associate professor of English at the University of North Florida. Now, you have written a book recently on myths and history. One of the uh, big questions here, of course, is uh, Bigfoot is basically a legend, a myth to most people. We, we have no physical evidence of it uh, to speak of. How do these myths perpetuate themselves? Basically, through human experience and human interest, what we've seen is that uh, a number of people in these films have found the idea of Bigfoot enormously fascinating. And the things that they find fascinating are, I think, <coughs> strength, uh, wisdom. I mean, the Bigfoot was spoken of as having some sort of a, uh, a natural wisdom, uh, a feeling that, they, that the Bigfoot is uh, perhaps dangerous but has enormous capacities, maybe the capacities beyond any capacities that we might have ourselves. Uh, Robert Bly, the poet, in the past several years has uh, been, has called a lot of attention to the story of Eisenhans, or Jack of Iron, in Grimm's fairy tales, about a wild man who lives in the forest and who is enormously dangerous and is found at the bottom of a pool and once found is able, uh, sort of runs off to the forest with the boy who's the hero of the story and is able to empower him in ways that enable him to become a, a, a fully adult person. So some sort of a, a fascination with a masculine image, particularly, I think is uh, generally connected with the, the Bigfoot legends as it's found at least in American sources. Do you find that most legend has some type of fact in it? The facts really are experiential facts. And that, that's the data in this case. And until we have uh, further data, we can certainly say that a great many people have an enormous interest in this figure and have direct experience, report direct experience of usually him, and that uh, they are fascinated to the extent that people such as the people we've been watching spend great chunks of their lives in the woods looking for even closer contact with this figure. Dr. Wolf, in, uh, we have heard so much about the American Indian uh, documenting through history uh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, the Yeti. Most of it appears to be um, the masks that we've seen a little bit earlier uh, seem to be those of an ape, uh, a large ape. How is it that uh, an American Indian, for example, would have an understanding of, of what uh, an African or Asian ape might look like uh, equating to Bigfoot? Well, the North American Indians are believed to come from Asia, and they may have come, left Asia at a time when orangutans were on the mainland of Asia, and may have had carried the, le the legends with them from Asia as they migrated to North America and then continued um, each new gen to tell each new generation about the, um, the apes that they had left behind. So it's the spoken history that's moved down through the years right. and has moved into their culture, so to speak. Right. Is there any type of uh, uh, substantiation to uh, the Bigfoot legend that would equate to the American Indian? Is there any, for example, explanation about it uh, from the Asian culture, for example? No, but now in the film that we saw, mostly Bigfoot was reported to be black, but very often they're reported to be reddish or de depicted to be reddish. And that would be even more evidence that the old legends originated in Asia with orangutans, who are sort of a brown to reddish color. Dr. Tunin, 
we've uh, we've heard a great deal about uh, about Bigfoot. We've seen rather blurred pictures. We've heard the legends. We've seen the masks. Um, but there is no real physical evidence aside from something like a man-made cast, for example. What is it that an anthropologist would consider to be enough evidence, documentation, in order to establish any reality uh, to, to the Bigfoot legend? Well, I, th I think from an anthropological perspective, the, the thing that, whether it be a physical anthropologist, an archaeologist, what have you, we'd like is, is the skeletal evidence. Mm -hmm. That, beyond a shadow of a doubt, would allow for some very um, interesting presentations and theories ab about the skeletal material and, and would probably, without a doubt, substantiate the claims. Mm -hmm. um, possibly, if Bigfoot is Neanderthal-like, uh, possibly cultural material, that is, tools, uh, habitation sites, something, occupations, something like that, that has a clear-cut context to it. And the same with the skeletal material. I mean, it's got to be in some sort of contextual form. Mm -hmm. um, th that, that's really what the anthropological community would like, is, is good, hard evidence. The experiential evidence, again, uh, fits closer to the myths and to the stories. The casts that have been produced so far are, again, uh, questionable to some Suspect degree. Suspected best. Um, and you would have thought throughout the years that we've had these reports, both here in the United States and in Europe, that we would get some solid skeletal evidence sooner or later. Mm -hmm. uh, and other than some fabrications at this point, we really haven't gotten anything like that. And we would hear. I mean, if there were skeletal evidence, it wouldn't be kept quiet. There wouldn't be a conspiracy or a silence on something like this. Mm -hmm. It would make its way into the general scientific community. Dr. Wolf. What about uh, the possibility of uh, some type of missing link? Uh, is it possible that something has survived uh, in its uh, uh, old world form, so to speak, uh, into today's environment? Well, it doesn't seem very likely to me. The um, Neanderthals, if it was a Neanderthal, um, the Neanderthals most likely had language but Bigfoot is always reported not to have language. The other possibility that's been suggested is are the robust Australopithecines who lived only in Africa about four million years, two million years, down to about one million years. Okay, that terminology, you have, you okay. have to excuse me, even I'm ignorant They're that. Um, the earliest human ape-like forms. Okay. Um, they were relatively large. There were smaller Australopithecines but the robust Australopithecines are the larger ones. But there's no skeletal evidence, there's no fossil evidence for robust Australopithecines outside of Africa or after two million years ago. The other possibility is a creature known as Gigantopithecus that lived from India over to, over China, over to China about 14 million years ago down to about 500,000 years ago. We only have bits and pieces of jaws and teeth for Gigantopithecus. There's no post-skeletal or post-cranial um, evidence. The nearest relatives of Gigantopithecus was not bipedal. They were sort of a generalized quadruped that was capable of swinging in the trees. So there, if Bigfoot is bipedal, that sort of, and the evidence is that Gigantopithecus, at least their, their closest relatives, were not bipedal, would suggest that, that this is not a, a gi that Bigfoot is not a, a Gigantopithecus. So the answer is no. There is no obvious link between Bigfoot and humans. Dr. Tilly, what do you think the, uh, the uh, love is of uh, a legend like uh, Sasquatch? I believe that in, in pursuing our projections uh, and pursuing our experiences of things like this, what we're doing is to fill in parts of ourselves that we somehow missed or that we need to move on toward, that essentially what's going on is, is a movement toward uh, psychic integration, psychic wholeness, and that one way to approach the material is in terms of, of general psychodynamics to say what need does this material satisfy, 
what sorts of identity do we project on these figures uh, about them? After all, even if they do exist, we have very little direct knowledge. And uh, then given those projections, uh, what does that say about us? What does that say about what it is that we feel lacking in ourselves? We're not at home in the world, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least in the view of the man who, who said, look, these, uh, the, these beasts are perfectly at home here, and, and we've, we've lost our way. And, uh, this is this is their world. Mm -hmm. They live in nature. That's right. It's their world. Well, it's our world, and that's what really we have to come to see is that through them, what we're doing is reclaiming that world. Dr. Wolf, in your expert opinion, uh, does Scott Sasquatch, does Bigfoot, does Yeti exist? I I am doubtful, but as a scientist, I have to keep an open mind. But um, I don't see any real evidence that he exists. And uh, Dr. Tan? I'd have to agree with that. Um, for as many years as people have been searching for the hard evidence, no one has succeeded yet. That, that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep an open mind, but um, we have a love for the mysterious, and I think this is part of that love. And Dr. Tilly, if, of you, had your if you had your druthers, <laughs> if you had your druthers, <laughs> does he exist? Absolutely. That is the experience of these beings exist, and really has existed for a long time in the form of giants, uh, primal beings of all sort. That is, this is something that we didn't just discover, and it, it's been with us as a, uh, as a potential for experience in a great many forms. Well, there you have it, our panel of experts. Bigfoot, fact or fiction? You decide. Good night, everybody.